Okay, um, so the last topic I wanted to cover is some stuff on parameter estimation. So, so I said at the start of this lecture, the two things you might want to do with uh, data analysis, one is um, find signals, and the other is characterize them. So we talked about methods for finding things in data, and now I'm going to talk about methods for estimating parameters. Uh, and these are mostly Bayesian um, and based on Bayes' theorem. Um, I think Alessandra mentioned Bayes' theorem at some point in one of her lectures, but just a quick recap. Um, so Bayes' theorem is, a, is basically a relationship between probability distributions, and it's based on the definition of conditional, co uh, conditional probability. Uh, which is the statement about the probability that something happens given that something else is known already to have happened. Uh, and this probability is just the probability that they both take place by the probability that the thing you're conditioning on uh, has taken place. If you rearrange this, you get Bayes' theorem. Um, the probability that A given B is equal to the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. Okay, there's nothing uh, deep here, this is just using this relationship twice, um, uh, where it becomes more uh, more philosophical is when you then start applying it to data and you regard um, B as being your, your data, the thing that you've just estimated, A as being some property of uh, the universe, or some parameters of your system, or so on. Um, and then the probability that the system parameters have a particular value given what you've observed depends on the probability that you would have seen that data given what you uh, given those parameters. That's the likelihood uh, times the probability that those uh, those are the parameters of the source. Okay. Now this P of A is something you don't know. It's a property of the universe, but um, it you might have some uh, thoughts about what that could be. Uh, and so this is called your, your prior, it's your belief about the property of the system before you take data. Uh, you then take the data, which is characterized by this likelihood, um, and that leads to your posterior distribution, which is your understanding about the universe uh, after you've taken the data. Okay, um, so you'll see Bayesian statistics used widely in inference these days. Uh, it took a long time for Bayes' theorem to become popular, and that's because it's computationally expensive usually to evaluate these things. Uh, it has to be done numerically, and it's only because computers have become more powerful recently uh, that this has become feasible. Um, now, in parameter estimation, if all you care about is this distribution of A given B, so your distribution of the parameters of a source given uh, the, the data, um, this quantity in the bottom, P of B, that's the probability distribution of data sets, uh, this is, yeah, you can ignore, it's just a normalization constant, uh, but we'll come back to that uh, later on uh, because this does have a use uh, in a model selection context. Okay, so that, that's what we want to do. We have right, written down Bayes' theorem. Uh, we want to work out our distribution um, of parameters of a source given what we've observed, the data, and it's given by Bayes theorem, this relationship to the likelihood and the prior uh, normalized by this quantity, the evidence. Okay, now how do you evaluate that? Well, one way you can evaluate it is just to consider a, a grid of points in your parameter space. For each choice of theta, you calculate this thing, you calculate this thing, and you get a number, and then that uh, you can write down all those numbers and you get um, a posterior distribution. That becomes increasingly impractical as you go to larger numbers of dimensions because um, you, uh, if you need 100 points in each dimension and you have 100, uh, 10 dimensions, then uh, that's 10 to the 20 uh, different evaluations you have to do. Uh, so this becomes increasingly inefficient as an approach in high dimensions, though it's, it's the right thing to do in low dimensions. Um, and so in high dimensions, you tend to use uh, stochastic methods. Um, and the idea there is that you generate a bunch of samples that are, dr that are um, drawn in proportion 
to the thing that you're trying to represent. So we, um, our posterior distribution is a probability distribution. What we want to do is generate a bunch of values of the parameters uh, that are distributed in proportion to that probability distribution. Um, if we can do that, then you can uh, then do everything you might want to do with a posterior distribution. In particular, you can calculate expectation values and so on by doing integrals uh, using a sum over these samples. So you end up being able to approximate the integral of f, p of, uh, f of theta, p of theta by a sum of uh, the function you want to uh, uh, average, uh, evaluated at each of the points in your set, um, and uh, then you sum them up and divide by the number of points. Okay. So this is, uh, you'll hear people talk about um, MCMC, Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Uh, it's one of the methods you can do for generating such a set of samples. Uh, and the reason that this set of samples is useful is that you can then do things like this, which allow you to ask questions about the properties of a source um, after you've uh, detected it and collected data. Okay, so uh, the basic... Uh, idea of MCMC uh, is to produce such a distribution um, and it works provided uh, by constructing something called uh, a Markov chain. A Markov chain is a sequence in which the next point only depends on the current point uh, and not on the past history of the chain. Uh, you can show that if you construct such a Markov chain that satisfies detailed balance, which means uh, basically the probability that if you're at a point theta and then move, uh, and move from there to theta dashed, that's the same as the probability that if you're at theta dashed you move uh, to theta. Okay. Um, so if you construct a Markov chain satisfying detailed balance, uh, then in the long term when you have many samples from this chain, you end up with a distribution of points that is proportional to the, the target distribution, uh, which in our case is the posterior on the parameters. Okay, now there are different techniques for constructing such a uh, Markov chain, and the most widely used is something called the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. So the way this works is you start uh, by choosing a random point in parameter space, uh, and then at each subsequent step, step you propose a new point by drawing from some distribution. So we have a probability distribution that says where we, how we move from where we are to another point. Um, and then at that new point, you work out uh, your target distribution, um, which is, uh, in our case, is the, the posterior distribution at that new point. Um, and then you compare the ratio of the posterior and the new point times the probability you move from the, sorry, the posterior at the old point, um, uh, other way around, you compare the posterior at the new point times the probability you would move uh, from the old point to the new point, uh, sorry, the new point to the old point, divided by the same quantities but with theta and theta dash the other way around. Okay. Uh, this number is called the Metropolis-Hastings ratio. If it's bigger than one, you always accept the move. Um, apart from this factor of the, the proposal distribution, which is often one, because uh, you use symmetric proposals that make it likely to go from one point to another or back. Um, essentially, if you're saying that if you find a point that has higher probability, you definitely move there. Um, if this number is less than one, so the new point has lower probability, you sometimes move there anyway. Um, and uh, your probability of moving is the value of this uh, quantity uh, in that case. So if you propose a new point that has likely of much, uh, is likely of higher than your current point, sorry, posterior density higher than your current point, you always move there. If it's lower than the current point, but only a little bit, you often move there. Um, if it's much lower than the uh, new point, uh, the old point, you almost never uh, move there. <laughs> yeah. So, People go for Markov chains. Uh, is it because that's the only thing you can do, or is it a simplifying assumptions? Or what, what's involved in making those choices? Um, yes. So it isn't. I believe it is not the only thing you can do. Um, 
So I'll talk later on about nested sampling, which does things in a slightly <coughs> different way. Uh, you have ensemble samplers. Uh, so nested sampling and ensemble samplers are using multiple points simultaneously, and they're moving those points around in a slightly different way. Um, so it is not the only thing you can do. The, the Markov uh, thing was the first thing people looked at. Um, and then the, because it's a sufficiently simple model that you only need to think about uh, a single move rather than a history of moves, um, it makes it easy to find a condition, which is this one, that satisfies that detailed balance. If you do and something more you're guaranteed to generate a sequence that has the right PDF? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you do this, you're guaranteed to get what you, you want. Um, that doesn't mean it's the only way to do it, but it's a way in which you can prove that you, you will uh, converge eventually. Okay, now, um, so it, it, the, the idea is simple. Um, you moving a sequence of points, uh, but the details are complicated, uh, and mostly because of how you choose this proposal distribution. That can have a big influence on how quickly you get uh, useful samples. Okay, so, an illustration of this, if you just uh, choose your new point randomly, so that proposal distribution is just a random draw from your prior, your, it's very inefficient, because if your uh, posterior peak is very uh, concentrated in parameter space, you're wasting a lot of time trying samples that have no chance of being accepted. Um, so what you really want to do is to have a proposal that's tuned to the distribution you're sampling, so if you, you want something in which you're moving by an amount that is sort of compatible with the typical width of a posterior. Okay. Now, it may take you a while to find that peak, but once you find it, you want to explore it as efficiently as possible. Um, so often people use Gaussian proposal distributions, but then this width tuning is an issue. If you choose a, a width that's too wide, then again you're inefficient, because you know, if you're at this point on the posterior, and you're typically proposing jumps that take you off uh, into the very low probability region, uh, you're almost never going to accept them because you need to have a statistically unlikely small jump uh, in order to move around. Okay, so that tends to lead to low acceptance rates. Um, equally, if you have uh, a jump that is too small, um, you're always accepting it, you get very high acceptance rates, but all of the new samples you're getting uh, tend to be correlated with old ones. Okay, and so they're very small steps, you're moving around a lot, but you're not really exploring very much of this uh, posterior because um, it takes you a long time to get all the way uh, to other regions of high probability. So you need to do a bit of tuning of that uh, acceptance rate, uh, and there are um, some various techniques uh, for doing that. Um, one way, so uh, yeah, part of the problem, uh, as I sort of alluded to uh, before, is that you don't necessarily know before you start what your distribution looks like. Uh, if, you, if you know that your parameter is between minus 5 and 5 and the posterior looks like this, then you're going to find it very fast. But in practice, you tend to have a much bigger parameter space in which your uh, posterior is concentrated, uh, and so you need to find it first uh, and then explore it. So one technique for doing that is something called annealing. Um, and the idea here is that you sample in a different distribution, which is related by raising the distribution you're interested in to some uh, power, which is characterized by a 1 over a temperature. So when the temperature is big, uh, you're raising this to a small power, so it, uh, it lowers the contrast, it flattens out your peak, so it becomes much broader. Um, and so the idea of that is that if you have a very broad distribution, it's very easy to move around it, um, and hence you can find the peak quite quickly. Um, and so uh, there are two different ways neon can be used. You can sample in the, uh, the hot temperature and then cool it a bit and sample some more, and cool it a bit and sample some more, and so on. Uh, or you can do it where you have multiple chains running simultaneously in at different temperatures uh, and exchanging information. Um, so that's one trick that's quite widely used in order to uh, speed up the identification of peaks, and it also helps give you some estimate of the typical size of the, the peak, which can then be used to tune the step size um, that you use for the final sampling of the distribution. <coughs> 
uh, yeah, so this is what I was just saying. Um, annealing, uh, if you're using multiple chains at different temperatures simultaneously, uh, this is called parallel tempering because you have multiple temperatures running simultaneously. Uh, and at each time, there's a possibility to exchange information, which basically means you can move one of the chains to a point that the other chain is currently at. Um, and you, if you do that with this acceptance probability, uh, you maintain this detailed balance, uh, and so uh, you can make sure that you're sampling from the posterior. Okay, so another sort of subtlety in, uh, in CMC is dealing with uh, burn-in. Um, this is again related to the issue of finding the peak in the first place. Uh, as we were saying a few minutes ago, you're guaranteed to converge to the stationary distribu distribution eventually, um, but depending where you start, it may take you a while until you're properly sampling from the probability distribution. And so we will typically see if you look at a trace plot, so the location in parameter value uh, of your Markov chain as a function of uh, iteration number, um, you might see some transient behavior to start with as it moves in a particular direction uh, and then it starts oscillating about. So uh, when you see your chain oscillating about uh, some fixed value, this is when it's properly sampling from the the actual posterior, um, and this bit here is what we call burn-in when it's finding the region of parameter space that has uh, that high probability. Uh, okay, now, if you've tuned your Markov chains reasonably well, then uh, this burn-in is normally only a few hundred or a few thousand samples, but uh, you do have to be careful and you have to uh, look for uh, these sorts of diagnostics to make sure you're getting to the right <coughs> point. Okay, um, so an, another issue, uh, which again is something I alluded to in an earlier slide, having high acceptance rates is not the same as having lots of uh, samples in your posterior, because if you have a high acceptance rate, the chances are that each point you're looking at is very close to the previous point, and so you're not getting independent samples from the distribution, uh, which is what you really need. Um, so as long as you have a long enough chains, you have enough samples, you can use all of the samples for, for inference even though they're not independent, um, but you, uh, yeah, what you do need to know the number of independent samples for is to figure out how accurately uh, you're making inferences when you then integrate over that posterior distribution. Okay, and so one way you can do this is by estimating uh, autocorrelation, so this is the same definition of autocorrelation that we had for time series, uh, you basically compare the state at a certain uh, point to the state a certain number of points later. Um, and so there are, you can construct autocorrelations at different lags, that's you know, numbers of points into the past that you're looking, um, and uh, you'll typically find this autocorrelation is high for short lags and it tends to zero for longer lags, um, and so you if you pick a value of k that's large enough that the autocorrelation is small, uh, you can basically only take, you can take one sample uh, every k uh, steps, which is called thinning, um, and then those, you have many fewer samples at the end, but they are all independent of one another. Uh, and the inference you get using that thin set is typically as precise as the inference you get using the whole set, because that whole set just has uh, K copies of um, the same set of samples, essentially. Okay, um, so a few comments and diagnostics. I mentioned a couple of these already. Uh, people look at acceptance rates um, uh, because it's an idea of how well things are moving around. Uh, a 25% acceptance rate is optimal. Why? Uh, well, this number comes from um, balancing this notion of getting independent samples with this notion of uh, getting lots of samples. Okay, so um, if you if you think about it, if you take the product of your acceptance rate with your uh, autocorrelation rate, 
uh, sorry, autocorrelation length, then that tells you how rapidly, how frequently you're getting an independent sample. Uh, now it turns out that if you have small step sizes, so you have a high acceptance rate, you have very long autocorrelation lengths. If you have uh, low acceptance rates, so you're taking big jumps, you have a, um, a short autocorrelation length but a low acceptance rate. Uh, and people have done studies and they find that if you target 25%, uh, although there is a dimensional dependence in here that I've missed out, but roughly 25% uh, gives you that maximum in terms of the rate of getting independent samples. Uh, and so that is something that people strive against. Uh, you know, the things you look at for MCMC runs is to see whether the distributions look sensible, are they smooth and well sampled, are you running up against prior boundaries, uh, which means your distributions get cut off artificially? Um, do is the chain moving sensibly? Is it you know, wobbling about some fixed value, or is it moving uh, uniformly in parameter space? Um, if you run the same analysis starting with different seed points, do you get consistent results? Um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you also look at this uh, yeah, co convergence uh, tests. Um, which basically asks if uh, subsets of the chain are consistent with one another. So you divide, uh, you take two separate uh, sets of samples, you calculate their uh, within chain variance and their between chain variance, uh, and you construct a statistic that says uh, if you know, this number is close to one, then your, both of your chains are long enough uh, that you can say you've got um, you know, a large number of independent samples and you've uh, sampled the whole probability distribution. Okay, so uh, as an example of that from a, a LIGO point of view, um, if you uh, are ever doing parameter estimation in LIGO, uh, the, the codes that LIGO uses to do parameter estimation uh, produce pages of output that have lots of plots on them. But what you'll see for particular parameters uh, are a sequence of um, uh, yeah, pl plots like this. So the one on the left hand side is the posterior distribution uh, on the particular parameter. So this is marginalized over all the other <coughs> parameters. Uh, in this case I've taken the two masses which are about 30 and about 35. Uh, you have plots in the middle which basically show uh, where the chain is moving. This is the thing you want to see oscillating up and down. You'll notice that they do appear to be... Uh, so there's a periodicity here where the variance suddenly gets bigger. Uh, that's done deliberately. It's a, an annealing uh, procedure that um, basically increases the size of the steps uh, periodically, and so that's to be expected. Um, and it's okay. And then you also look at the autocorrelation function. Uh, you want this, uh, this is the thing that it's talking about, that's the number of rates at which you're getting independent samples. Uh, in this case, every, uh, so autocorrelation is quite low, but it gets to close to zero after about a thousand points. So our, except, our rate of independent samples is about one every uh, 500 to 1,000. Uh, points in this case. Okay, so um, having done all this, what you get is the set of samples which represent your posterior distribution. And as I said, the reason you want that is that you can then calculate integrals of things. Okay, now one of the integrals you might want is just the integral of that uh, distribution over all the parameters you don't care about. Um, but that just means what you do is you've got, the, each sample has uh, n values associated with it which correspond to all of the individual parameter values. If you just plot the histogram of one parameter or a pair of parameters, uh, that's equivalent to uh, marginalizing over all of the others. Uh, and that's how you get one-dimensional plots like the, the gray ones here, uh, or 2D plots like the one in the middle. So again, this is an example for 150914. You will see plots like this in all of the LIGO papers. Uh, these are constructed in exactly this way, uh, using MCMC to generate a bunch of samples, and then looking at the distribution uh, of those samples in uh, one or two dimensions. Uh, so this case, we have masses here, and we have 
Das wäre in seiner Rede. Ja. So, an anti percent confidence uh, you know, boundary. How do you make that unique? Uh, Sorry, I don't use the words that I know. So, yeah. Um, there are infinitely many 90% confidence boundaries you could draw. Um, so, there are, norm, there are standard conventions for doing this. Uh, the one we use is to take the uh, what's called an HPD confidence interval, so it's the highest posterior density. Essentially, what you do in this 2D diagram, you have um, you have dark points at all of these places. Uh, that's where we have higher we have higher numbers of samples. That's higher density. Uh, what you can imagine doing is you know, they call it filling the water. So you. Imagine that your posterior is sitting in a tank of water and you gradually drain the water out. Um, it moves down the posterior distribution until 90% of your samples lie above the water level and then you stop. Now, whatever contour you get at that point um, is our 90% contour. So it, it, it should be the smallest 90% contour you can draw around your posterior distribution. But obviously, since we have finite numbers of samples, uh, there is some uncertainty uh, in the boundary. But that's the way we construct these. Okay. Um, yeah. So the one D distributions is generally a, a bit easier. Um, normally, what LIGO quotes are <laughs> maximum, uh, well, of median um, and uh, highest posterior density intervals. Um, but another common convention is to quote. Uh, maximum likelihood um, and symmetric confidence intervals. Those are things that put equal probability in the two tails. Mm -hmm. So then a 90% interval would have 5% here and 5% here. Um, LIGO is generally quite good about being explicit about which of those two conventions is being used, uh, but you do have to you know, know what the two definitions mean. Yep. I have a question though. Do you know like how many detected events you would need for readjusting your prior to something that is informed? Um, no. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I mean, that is a, a good question. Um, the yeah, I'm going to talk about hierarchical models in a, in a second, and that will answer go some way to answering that. Um, so the question is, at what point do we uh, use prior information that comes from other events to modify these posteriors? So at the moment, you know, Bayes' theorem, we're taking our likelihood, we're multiplying by a prior. Uh, for a single source, that prior is a statement about the probabilities of particular masses, and it spins, and so on. At the moment, what we're using are uninformative priors. So we're saying mass could be anything within a certain range, uh, uniform between um, two limits with uh, cutoffs, because n1 has to be bigger than n2, with definition, our definitions, and so on. Um, you're absolutely right that at some point we know enough about the population to know that it's where you know, we have more heavy black holes than we have light black holes, for example. Um, and so then, the analysis of an individual event, you should use a different prior that is not uniform in mass. Um, in the future, we will be constraining both things simultaneously. Um, so the idea would be that, uh, let me see, is it? Oh yeah, okay. I'm about to get onto it, so if you give me two seconds. Uh, well, I can skip that one out, it's just another posterior distribution. Um, so this is the idea of a hierarchical model. Okay, so I've talked so far about a situation in which you have a single data set, you've got some prior on the properties of that data set, which in this case are the parameters of the source, uh, and now we, um, uh, anyway, and then we take our data, we analyze it, and we try and work out what the properties of the source are. Going further, we can say, well, the prior for a particular binary, um, what its masses are, etc. That depends on the properties of the population. So now that prior, rather than being this boring flat thing, we introduce some parameters that characterize that prior. 
So we say the mass function is, is a power law, um, or it's flattened or mass, or something like this. Um, and so then we introduce some parameters, which are parameters in our prior for any given gravitational wave event, but they're also things that we then care about. Um, and so you then have a, so you have your prior on a single event, which depends on some parameters. You set a prior on those parameters, and so then when you combine multiple events, you can start to say something about the parameters of the population, as well as the parameters of individual events. So this is what we call a hierarchical model. Um, you know, there's an example here, which was constraining, or constraining the Hubble constant. Uh, the idea here is that you know, there is a uniform Hubble constant in the universe. Um, this uh, bat plus a redshift of a given source determines the luminosity distance, uh, which determines um, the intrinsic SNR or gravitational wave signal, uh, which itself then determines the data in our detector. Uh, but also this luminosity distance determines um, the amplitude of an EM counterpart, which we may or may not see, uh, and so on. So these hierarchical models, you have uh, priors on priors on priors, uh, and you can build up a quite complicated model that way. You, uh, in principle, what you then do is just write down the, the biggest model you have, which is, has all of these parameters that are for the population and the individual sources, you sample a posterior in all of them, and then you take marginals to work out uh, particular things. So we have 100 binary black holes. Um, for each one of those binary black holes, we have 15 parameters that characterize the, that particular binary. And then we also have an additional five or however many parameters that represent the population, uh, the, the overall population of binary black holes. So then our, our data set has this uh, 100 binaries with 10 parameters, so there's uh, 1,000 parameters for you, plus the 5 of the population. You sample in this 1,005 dimensional parameter space, and then you take the marginals uh, that marginalize over the individual binary parameters to deduce properties of the population, and you marginalize over the population parameters and the other binaries to get information about individual sources. Okay. So that's you know, ultimately what you need to do. Uh, it sounds horrendously complicated. It's not so bad because you can do it sequentially. You add in a new source uh, and update the old posterior rather than having to resample in a very big parameter space. Um, and you can also make life a bit easier by uh, being clever about how you structure the, the model. You make assumptions about how things depend on other things rather than making everything completely arbitrary uh, and that conditional independence structure that you uh, impose uh, can also simplify uh, this analysis. Does that, does that make sense? So at this point we don't, I mean, we have tried, so the way LIGO has done analyses so far, we've used these flat priors for individual events. Having sampled the posteriors for those individual events, we have then asked whether there's any evidence for non-flat mass distributions. Uh, and at the moment, everything's perfectly consistent with the priors that are being used. Once we have 10 more events, then maybe that starts to be not the case anymore, and we have to do this uh, analysis a bit more carefully um, to make sure everything is treated consistently. Okay. Uh, so yeah, a couple of examples of these hierarchical analyses. The Hubble constant analysis, uh, is, I mean, it's not really hierarchical because we only have one event, but it will become hierarchical in the future as we add more of these sources because we have a single Hubble constant that will be common to all of the binary neutron stars uh, we see. Um, and uh, this, uh, the rate estimate analysis, uh, I also showed this in the earlier, um, this is also kind of a hierarchical analysis because we're saying something about the numbers of black holes uh, based on seeing a, a bunch of individual systems. Okay, uh, so I think two more things on MCMC before I move on to talk about evidences. Um, the, in Implicit in what I've said so far has been that we're here, we know that there's a source in the data. Um, 
and in the LIGA context, because we do this separate search and then parameter estimation, that's reasonably okay. Um, although you know, the chances are there are quieter things in the data that we um, are not yet identifying. For something like Lisa, where you have lots of sources in the data simultaneously, you uh, also want to sample in that variable uh, number of sources. And there are techniques for doing that. One of them is called reversible jump uh, MCMC, Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo. Um, the idea here is that you have a, you don't just have uh, a single model with a fixed number of dimensions, but you can propose moving to different <coughs> model spaces uh, which have different parameterizations. So in the context of gravitational waves, what this would mean is you add in another source, uh, or you take a source away, um, and so you're sampling not only in parameters of individual sources, but in parameters uh, of, uh, in the number of, the total number of sources. Okay. So the technique for doing that, you need to, um, because of the, this difference in dimensionality, um, it's harder to ensure this detailed balance because um, the proposal distribution, I mean, if you're adding a source, then you need to draw more random numbers than if you're taking one away. In a sense, you know, you've got a source that's parameterized by seven parameters. If you take that source out, that's a single decision. If you add it in, then that's eight decisions because you have to say you're going to add it in and then choose the seven parameters. Uh, and so this means that when you're doing reversible jump, MCMC, you're keeping track uh, not only of your current parameter values, but some random numbers, which basically tell you if you're gonna move uh, to another point or not. Okay? And so that then allows you to do this detailed balance thing. You have random numbers in, your, uh, in one parameter space and in the other, uh, and that allows you to say how you would move between them uh, and write down the generalization of the metropolis hastings acceptance ratio. Uh, it looks very similar to the uh, standard case. You're comparing the posterior of the new point to the old point. Uh, you get some uh, a correction from a Jacobian transformation uh, between these two uh, parameter spaces. Uh, but other than that, it's very similar. Um, so another way you can do something similar is uh, what's called, what Alvin called product space MCMC. Um, it's you know, very similar in principle, but the difference is that uh, you choose in advance the maximum number of sources that you might be interested in fitting. Okay? And so then um, you keep track of so you said that we, we have no more than m sources in the data. For each one of those m sources, we have a set of parameters that characterizes it. Uh, so that's this lambda 1 to lambda m vectors. And then we also have another parameter that says how many of these sources we currently include uh, and how many we don't. So you're always keeping track of m sets of parameter values, but you're only using k of them to evaluate your likelihood. So it's like you're, as you propose a change in K, you're adding in another source or you're taking it away. But because you're keeping um, all of these parameters there all of the time, when you add that new source in, you tend to be adding it with plausible parameter values. So if you've previously been sampling in the 10-dimensional space, um, then maybe you've got a bit of a match with your 10th uh, binary. You then go back down to nine dimensions, and you move around a bit more, and then when you come back up to 10 dimensions, that the lambda 10 has changed a little bit, but it's still pretty close to what was giving you a reasonable fit before, and that means it's more likely that that move would still be accepted. Okay. Um, so in this recent paper, um, Alvin looked at uh, this in the context of uh, constraining deviations from GR using uh, LISA observations. Um, and found that he was getting about uh, an order of magnitude improvement in efficiency uh, for the particular problem he was doing uh, when compared to standard uh, RJ MCMC. Okay, but the big disadvantage here is that you need to specify what this maximum number of sources is, and um, you, you don't really know that. Uh, and for something like LISA, if you wanted to do this for galactic binaries, this maximum number would be tens of thousands and that's a lot of parameters to carry around with you. 
Okay, so um, I said when I introduced Bayes' theorem that this thing in the denominator uh, is the evidence and we don't really worry about it in parameter estimation because it's just a normalization factor. Uh, what we're interested in is the probability distribution of theta. This quantity in the denominator doesn't depend on theta uh, and so if what you're doing is drawing random samples from this product distribution on the top, their distribution uh, is going to be uh, correct, irrespective of calculating this quantity in the bottom. Okay, so that is all true. Uh, but there are situations in which you want to calculate this quantity because it has some physical meaning, and that is it is the, the, a meaning as a probability of seeing the particular data set you've seen under the model assumptions that you're making. Okay, so uh, often we might have more than one model of the data. Um, and so we might then want to calculate this evidence uh, for one model and the evidence for another model, um, and then uh, that allows us to compare those two models. Okay, this is what's called uh, calculating the posterior odds. It's the probability of the model given the data, of one model given the data divided by other model given the data, which is related to this, uh, the evidences um, times uh, the, the prior odds. Your, yeah a priori bias towards one model, model or the other. Okay, so this is all fine. This is yeah, a, a technique for model selection. We calculate the Bayesian evidence. We take ratios of evidences for different models. If that ratio is big for, in favor of one model, then we say that that's a better representation of the data um, than the other one. But there's a problem with calculating uh, this because um, it's an integral of a parameter space uh, and yeah, we, the way that we're trying to sample our posterior is not well suited to calculating evidences uh, accurately. Uh, and a way to see this is um, what the evidence is, it's the normalization of our posterior, it's the integral of uh, P of D given lambda or theta times P of theta. Um, you can rewrite that in this slightly awkward way as saying 1 over Z is uh, the integral of 1 over uh, p times 1 over your likelihood times the prior times the likelihood of the evidence. Okay? You stare at this a second, you'll see that the likelihood bits cancel. You can take the 1 over z out the front and then you just got an integral over your prior, which has to be 1 because it's a probability distribution. Okay, why do we write it like this? Well, you write it like this because this uh, thing here is what you'll, you generate from your MCMC. You're generating samples from this distribution. So we've now written something that gives us the evidence as an integral over uh, the posterior. And so we can estimate it by taking uh, the sum of the values of this thing uh, over our MCMC samples. Okay, sounds fine. Uh, the problem is that we're now taking the sum of one over likelihoods. Okay. Um, our MCMC is designed to take most of its samples where the posterior is large. So we're not getting uh, very we're not getting a very good representation of the tails of the distribution where the likelihood is small. Uh, and small values of this completely dominate uh, this sum. Okay? And so this is a very numerically unstable way to calculate evidences. And so this was thought this was a problem for a long time. Uh, people didn't know how uh, to get uh, these things um, accurately. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, take your samples of the posterior and then do some uh, kind of binning of them uh, and evaluate the posterior on each one and get the integral of the evidence that way. That works a bit better, uh, but it's um, not as precise as the method uh, I'm about to talk about. Okay, um, So there's a technique called nested sampling, which was introduced about 10, slightly more than 10 years ago by John Skilling. Um, which is a, a more efficient way or a more precise way to calculate evidences. Um, so what he noticed was that uh, the, the, in, the evidence is an integral over the prior, integral of likelihood times prior. Uh, he re-expressed this as an integral over a one-dimensional quantity, which is basically the prior weight enclosed within a contour of constant likelihood. So the idea is that you 
have some distribution in many dimensions, you draw contours of constant likelihood. Um, these hopefully are nested if you have some kind of peak. Uh, and inside each one, there is uh, a fixed amount of prior volume. Um, and you use that prior volume as a label for these likelihood contours. And then your evidence is just the integral uh, over that prior weight uh, of the likelihood. Okay, so that reduces the uh, problem from a n-dimensional one to a one-dimensional one. Um, and then you need an algorithm for calculating this, and uh, the algorithm for calculating that, uh, that um, made nested sampling popular, was something called uh, multi-nest. Um, so the idea of this evidence integral, you need to get a bunch of likelihood samples that are distributed uniformly uh, within this prior volume, um, and uh, are ordered in increasing likelihood, uh, and then you can uh, basically sum up those likelihood values uh, times the prior weights, uh, and you get an estimate for the evidence. Um, now, the trick in this is to draw those new likelihood samples. So you want to always find likelihoods that are higher than your uh, current lowest likelihood. And the way that Multinest did this was to use a set of points um, that are moving around in parameter space. Each one of those points um, has a likelihood associated with it, um, and at each step, what multi-nest does is throw away the point with lowest likelihood and replace it with one that has higher likelihood than that lowest value. Okay, to do that, it needs to draw uniformly from the prior within that ISO likelihood contour, otherwise we're not calculating the right thing. Um, and so you need some way to represent that ISO likelihood contour. And Multinest does this by partitioning the set of current points uh, into a set of overlapping ellipsoids. And there are a couple of examples here of how that can be done. So it knows where all its current points are. Um, they all have higher likelihood than the lowest point. So uh, if you draw ellipses around the set of all the points you have, you can be reasonably sure that things inside those ellipses have higher likelihood um, than uh, things um, outside. And then you draw uniformly from that set of ellipses accounting for overlaps. Uh, and that then is the way for finding uh, higher, amplitude, higher likelihood points. OK, so this algorithm works quite well. Um, and as well as computing evidences, it returns uh, posterior probabilities. Um, this movie shows uh, how multi-nest works. Um, we start with a, so um, this distribution is a, a, what's called an egg box likelihood. You've got a sum of Gaussians that range over a regular grid. Uh, as multi, when multi-nest starts, um, it has points distributed across the grid. Uh, and these are then gradually adjusted. And you see points are removed and added, uh, and it climbs up. Uh, the likelihood, um, so climbs at the posterior surface uh, to the top of the egg box. Okay, so it's been widely used since it was introduced uh, in astrophysics, but also other fields. Um, it's been used for gravitational waves in a number of different ways. Uh, the example here was detection of uh, cosmic string cusps in Mock Lisa data challenge uh, data. Um, this application was focused on parameter estimation, so this was equivalent to doing an MCMC, but in the same paper, uh, it was explored whether um, the evidence could be used to distinguish a burst in the La Lisa data as being from a cosmic string as opposed to an, an alternative. And so the question that was asked was, is the evidence higher for a cosmic string model or for a sine Gaussian model? Um, there. And in all cases, uh, the evidence, so what's plotted here is this evidence calculated by Multinest uh, as a function of the, the loudness of the source, the SNR, um, for a number of different uh, types of cosmic string and a number of different types of sine Gaussians. Uh, and in each case, we're looking at the evidence uh, in favor of the true model versus the alternative. Uh, and you see that as you increase the SNR at some point, the evidence starts to significantly go up. Uh, and so you can confidently say not only that there is a source there, but that it is definitely a cosmic string and not 
um, in this case, a, a signed Gaussian. Uh, more recently, a couple of years ago, uh, some people from the same group came up with a, a new thing called Polychord, which is uh, works a bit differently to multi-nest, but is also a nested sampling uh, algorithm. Um, the principle is the same. It's trying to find samples of higher likelihood, but it does this using something called slice sampling. Uh, you basically pick a random direction to look in your posterior, uh, and you uh, look along a chord in that direction. You find points that are definitely of lower likelihood, uh, and then sample between them until you find a point of higher likelihood. Uh, another thing it does is use affine transformations to make um, features in the likelihood, which may be quite elongated, look more spherical. Uh, this helps with doing the slice sampling. It makes it more efficient. Um, now, Polychord was designed to be better in large numbers of dimensions, uh, and in the examples in the, uh, that have been used so far, this is true. Um, but it needs... You're talking about getting up to hundreds of dimensions or 800 dimensions before polychord outperforms multi nest. So, for typical applications in gravitational waves, polychord is likely to be uh, less efficient. Um, although this hasn't been properly investigated, the algorithm hasn't been allowed for a phenomenon. Okay. Um, so, one uh, final thing I wanted to mentioned in uh, this part of parameter estimation um, was uh, some techniques that have been developed over the last five to ten years uh, which are called reduced order models. Um, I've been emphasizing that Bayesian techniques have only become popular recently because of the computational costs and this is very true in a gravitational wave context as well. Um, you, when you do this stochastic sampling, you need to evaluate your posterior, which means evaluating your likelihood, <coughs> at lots of different points in parameter space. Every time you propose moving to a new point of parameter space, you need to draw, you need to evaluate a new posterior value. Okay. This uh, can be expensive if your waveforms are very complicated or very long. And so there can be a high computational cost to doing parameter estimation because you have to evaluate waveform models again and again and again. Um, so reduced order techniques were introduced to combat this, uh, and the idea is that you try and um, project the likelihood calculation onto a lower dimensional space to make it cheaper uh, to evaluate. Uh, it turned out this was worked well for LIGO type sources because um, the um, these methods will work if the number of uh, waveforms you need to span your space of possible waveforms is smaller than the number of time samples that you have in a typical observation. Okay, so the idea is that you take a bunch of templates which cover your parameter space, you construct a combination that you uh, take a subset of them for which you can construct all the others by linear combinations, um, and then you only calculate the overlap of the data with that reduced uh, basis set. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the first stage, and this is an example uh, which was a, for a sine Gaussian model. Um, you, uh, you construct the reduced basis by a greedy algorithm. You start with one waveform in your set. Uh, you then pick whichever waveform in your bank is, uh, has the worst overlap with this, uh, the waveform you already have. You add that into the set, and then you repeat this process until the overlap of your reduced basis with the waveforms that are still uh, left in your template bank gets below some threshold. Uh, and this appears to show exponential uh, convergence, which means you can get away with many fewer waveforms than you might typically expect. Uh, having got that reduced basis, you uh, can then go a little bit further what we need if we're doing parameter estimation is to calculate uh, likelihoods, which means getting overlaps of your waveform uh, with the data. Now this waveform overlap is a sum of uh, h times d. Now uh, if we've represented our waveform 
um, as a sum of uh, some other basis waveforms, we can pre-compute the overlap of those basis waveforms with uh, the data uh, and then more cheaply um, write down uh, the overlap for a, a new choice of uh, parameters. Okay. That sounds great, but um, the overlap depends on the coefficients <coughs> of your target waveform uh, on the basis. And so you need to be able to compute those coefficients in an efficient way. And the way this is done is to interpolate onto the basis rather than project onto the basis. So um, we have some set of waveforms. We want to represent our waveform as a sum of those. You could do that by taking the overlap of your waveform with each one of the waveforms in your set. That gives you a bunch of coefficients, and you reconstruct your final waveform um, as a, a sum of those with those coefficients. That doesn't help you reduce computational cost because that projection process is as expensive as taking the overlap of your original waveform uh, with the data. An alternative is to do interpolation. So you say instead of requiring your waveform to uh, be the, the best representation on the basis. You require your waveform to match the base, a linear combination of the basis at a certain number of points. So we say we want our H to be the same at this particular subset of frequencies. Um, those frequencies are chosen, again, using a greedy algorithm with some threshold on the, uh, the precision of the interpolation. Um, but having done this, you find that in order to calculate one of these overlaps, all you need to do is evaluate your waveform at this particular set of points, uh, and then you can get uh, its overlap cheaper. So um, this is why I said at the start, you end up with something that's more efficient only if the number of time samples in your original data set is larger than the number of waveforms in your reduced basis, uh, because this process reduces things to a, uh, a sum uh, equal to that number of uh, reduced uh, waveform um, elements as opposed to a sum that has a number of components equal to the number of original time or frequency samples. Okay, so this technique was developed um, uh, in LIGO and used, um, uh, yeah, has been used widely. Uh, the parameter estimates for the binary neutron star that were used um, in the detection paper were produced using these ROM models because they're they're much more efficient to use uh, than anything else. Okay? And so uh, most of the parameter estimation results that LIGO is producing these days are using these reduced order models rather than directly uh, taking um, even the EOB or IMR phenom models uh, and applying them to the data. Uh, we can't do this for LISA yet. That's work that needs to be done, but we have. 17 years to figure it out, so hopefully it'll get fixed. <laughs> okay, um, so it's 10 to 5. Uh, I had one more section in my presentation that I wasn't sure I'd get to or not. Um, so we've got 10 minutes. I'll spend the, yeah, those 10 minutes describing roughly what uh, this section is about, and then you can look at some more of the details uh, offline if you want to. Um, so this final topic is connected to backgrounds. So I talked uh, earlier about uh, detection of backgrounds using cross-correlation, but you also want to characterize backgrounds. So it's clear um, if you have a model, how you do parameter estimation, everything I've been talking about for doing this, these uh, sampling and so on, uh, is reliant on being able to calculate a likelihood, which depends on being able to calculate a model. Uh, for a background, you typically don't have uh, a model, and so you can ask what you can do uh, if you want to set about mapping a background. Uh, and one way you can go about doing this is finding ways to write down arbitrary distributions of gravitational waves uh, in some kind of basis, which you can attempt to then constrain uh, the co coefficients of using your data. Okay, so the approach uh, that we took to this was um, to represent the gravitational wave sky as a superposition of um, spin waves and spherical harmonics. Okay, so some of you will know what those things are. 
Uh, some of you will not yet, and so you don't realize what lies in store for you. Um, but uh, the idea of a spin weight is very harmonic. You, um, you want to represent something on the sphere which is not just a, a scalar, but it has also some direction associated with it. Okay, now, if you're talking about vectors on the sphere, you need to refer things to bases, and so the idea is that you have um, a function uh, which depends on uh, a location on the sky, this k-hat, and also a pair of uh, orthogonal vectors um, in that direction, which uh, gives you uh, a reference for defining uh, vectorial properties. So uh, such a function um, transforms in particular, uh, will transform in particular ways uh, as you rotate the L and M axis, so you do a rotation, if it changes, if it doesn't change, it's a scalar. If it changes by uh, cos of psi, then it's a vector. If it changes by cos of two psi, uh, it's a tensor, and so on. So these spin-weighted harmonics are objects defined with respect to these uh, you know, bases at each point on the sky that transform in particular ways uh, under rotations. Now, gravitational waves, we know if you rotate the polarization axes, these transform uh, like uh, tensors that's cos of two psi and sine of two psi you get in the rotation. Uh, and so these things should be representable as spin weight plus or minus two spherical harmonics um, on the sphere. Okay. Um, now, if you want to be in completely general, uh, you can think about what other types of gravitational wave backgrounds you might have. Um, and I don't know if Cliff will talk about this next week. This uh, plot I copied from one of Cliff's papers or books. Um, if you consider arbitrary uh, uh, tensor fields, um, symmetric tensor fields, then there are six possible polarization states that gradational waves could have. Um, so there are the two we uh, predict in GR, plus and cross, uh, but there are four additional modes. One of them is a scalar uh, mode. There are a couple of longitudinal modes. Um, one is scalar longitudinal, uh, and then there's a vector longitudinal mode, um, and the vector longitudinal mode uh, has two different uh, flavors depending uh, which um, direction things are uh, changing. Okay, now, um, if you allow for all of these possible polarization states, you can go through the same argument that we uh, did for the gravitational waves, and we, uh, so the GR gravitational waves, um, and you did deduce and ex you know, expect it as you might expect that the scalar modes should transform like spin weight zero, so scalar spherical harmonics, uh, and the vector modes transform like spin weight one things. And so you can represent all of these backgrounds uh, as combinations of these spin weight functions uh, on the sky. Okay, so what you can then do is for a particular type of experiment that is sensitive to a background, like pulsar timing, you can work out what the response you'd expect uh, in each of your pulsars would be from a mode of the background that is represented by a pure uh, spin weight uh, state of one form of the other. So there's some maths on the slide which I won't go through. Uh, the point is that you can go through this um, and you end up you end up with a fairly simple result that the response um, to a particular mode of the background for a pulsar in a particular direction, uh, there's a thing that depends on the, f the distance to the pulsar and the frequency of the gravitational waves, but then it's just uh, the dependence on sky location is just like um, a uh, spherical harmonic. So what this means is if you go out and measure redshifts of a bunch of pulsars, you can decompose those redshifts uh, into um, spherical harmonics on the sphere, and the components of those spherical harmonics pick out uh, or telling you about these different modes of the background. Okay, and so then, uh, yeah, so there are some plots of what these things look like. Um, so the, the idea of this uh, then is that you go out, you collect some data, you're measuring redshifts for pulsars across the sky. Uh, those redshifts you uh, decompose uh, into spherical harmonics. Um, and the coefficients of those spherical harmonics uh, are a sum of 
uh, the contributions from the tensor modes of GR, the scalar mode, uh, and these vector multitudinal modes. Um, and in principle, because, so the thing that then allows you to distinguish uh, the different, the tensor vector and scalar components is the fact that they have a different dependence on the distance to the pulsar. So if you have pulsars at multiple distances, then you can start uh, to tell the difference um, between them. Uh, in practice, we can't do this. I mean, you know, I've said this is not a nice way to represent backgrounds. We can decompose them into these uh, spherical harmonic bases and then measure the coefficients. In practice, we don't have enough data to measure all of the coefficients. Uh, in the pulsar timing case, we typically are timing 30 to 50 pulsars, so we can make 30 to 50 measurements, uh, and so we can't possibly determine all of the components of the background. But fortunately, we are more sensitive, you know, it turns out we're more sensitive to high L multiples, and those are the things that uh, you know, tend to dominate the response. So what you can start to do is uh, measure uh, bits of the background, and as you add more pulsars or take more data, uh, you can uh, do better and better. Um, so I'll finish with showing some pretty pictures. This was an example um, in which we uh, generated a gravitational wave background. Um, this is the real telemetry part. And then we attempted to uh, measure it using uh, pulsar time. Okay, so what I'm going to show is a sequence of plots uh, which represent the residual, so the difference between um, the true background and the bit that we can measure using pulsar timing. Um, so with one pulsar we start, you know, don't measure very much, as we add more uh, you'll notice that there are fewer and fewer of the red regions um, and the structures are getting smaller and smaller. So that's saying that with small numbers of pulsars we resolve large-scale uh, structures and as we uh, add more and more the uh, things that we're not resolving get smaller and smaller. Okay, and so it gives 100 pulsars uh, pretty well. Now there is one caveat here, and that is for pulsar timing, there's half of the gradation wave sky that we'll never see, um, and that's because we have no sensitivity to uh, a particular uh, mode of the background. Um, uh, but, <coughs> and that's essentially because pulsar, uh, we are at a fixed location when we're observing these pulsars. Um, and so uh, there is a component of the background which is basically have has zero effect at the location of the, the solar system. If we moved um, a gravitational wavelength away, we would see that bit of the background, but because the gravitational wavelengths at nanohertz frequencies are so long, we don't move by that much over the course of a year, uh, and so we can never resolve that bit of the background. It's not a problem for LIGO or LISA, where their frequencies are um, higher and so the wavelengths are shorter, uh, and then the motion of the Earth around the Sun is enough to resolve uh, all of the components of the background. Okay, so I went through that a bit quickly, but hopefully it gives you a flavour of what I was hoping to talk about here. Uh, as I said, um, you know, I left this to the end because it's less important than some of the other stuff, uh, and I'll make the slides available if you want to uh, go through it in your own time, and if you have questions, then please do feel free to send me an email. Okay, I'll stop there.